your training schedules to <laughs> come and listen to me ramble on. Um, this is what I want to talk about today. Um, the past talk, the talks, the previous talks I've done here, I've talked a bit about my background and, and growing up and what, uh, you know my job and how I got to be where I am today. So I didn't think I'd go over that again. Um, so I just thought I'd talk about my 2009 season, um, the, the the changes that took place with regard to where I was training, my coaches, and the other coach, and then another coach, and another one, um, and the races that I did, um, and go through a little bit about what I learned at you know at each race and the experiences I had, my preparation going into Kona, um, my training, um, my taper, uh, nutrition particularly, um, then the race itself, and just talk you through my, my experiences at, at Kona, um, what I've been doing since Kona, most importantly, um, and then what next year is going to look like, um, and uh, then into the future, and then afterwards, uh, question and answer and signing, and I've become very good at signing body parts. <laughs> <laughs> I had to sign. <laughs> Parts that Marker Penn shouldn't reach at Roth, so I'm very experienced now. Um, anyway, um, yeah, the, uh, 2008 really ended with um, me uh, splitting with uh, Brett Sutton, my previous coach, and Team TVB, and everyone wanted to know the reason why, and there was really no nothing more to it than, than, I, than I told uh, people at the time. Basically, Brett's running a development squad and every athlete under that, in, within that squad had to have the same sponsors and couldn't have their own manager. And I already had my, my own sponsors and had my own manager and I really couldn't fit into that kind of structure and neither could a lot of the other athletes. So all of us had to leave. So. It wasn't acrimonious and Brett and I are very much still in contact and I have to say now that I am self-coached I really draw on a lot of what Brett taught me mentally and physically in, in, in the, the training that I do um, do now so uh, you know I do still give him a lot of credit for, for, the, for the most recent victory. Um, I spent January um, in, uh, in Lanzarote, training at Club de Santa. I went there for a week and then I stayed there for a month. It, um, it was fantastic. I love training there. It's, um, it was a really good place for me to get back into my, into my routine. It's tough, it's difficult, it's hot and it's windy. And the Green Team show on a Monday night, for those that have been to Club de Santa will know what I'm talking about, is phenomenal. Especially when they do the striptease thing. The men, not the men. Um, anyway, so yeah, I spent January in Lanzarote, then I moved out to Boulder um, to, to basically uh, relocate there and, and live, live and train there. I was, I was training, um, training with Simon Lessing, he was, he was my coach. Um, being in Boulder just gave me one of the best opportunities to train with uh, some fantastic pro athletes. It's really a mecca. For, for triathletes and a lot of the best uh, athletes in the world are, are based there and not only that, not only triathletes but also you get a lot of um, the marathon runners uh, are, are there too so the Kenyans um, particularly have, a, have a, a, a training base there in the summer. I, I did a lot of my swimming or all of my swimming with, with the Masters squad there so Dave Scott is, is a coach of the Masters squad and his sister Jane Scott also leads some sessions. I did most of my riding with the guys or with Julie Dibbons, um, who many of you will, will know the reigning Xterra champion and that's light riding with a guy. So I mean she was, she's, she's a phenomenal athlete and I think you know is probably the best triathlete on the, on the circuit at the moment. She's, she's just a phenomenal talent. Um, it was quite difficult for me initially not to, not to be part of the team. Brett uh, runs a very tight ship and it's a very authoritarian kind of army soldier relationship and it was very difficult for me to be 
out of uh, out of that environment. Um, and I did feel quite exposed, and it was difficult for me initially to be in Boulder and there, there being so many athletes and triathletes around. I just felt like I was in a bit of a fishbowl. But I think I got used to it, and, and once you learn to manage it and to almost put up a little bit of a, a barrier and be a bit thick-skinned to what's being said, um, then it's uh, it's a lot of you know it it really is a phenomenal place to train. The the riding is um, the riding's great. This is Dion Harrison, who some of you might know, uh, a, a British uh, my Brit a British guy that's, that's just turned pro, one of my friends, and that's on one of the rides that that we do over the weekend. Um, so yeah, the riding the riding is superb. Um, the food shopping is fantastic. They've got like 10 zillion different varieties of peanut butter and nut butter and macadamia nut butter and all of this kind of butter. So I was in heaven. Um, and I learned to love beef jerky and eat marshmallows out of a can. It's <laughs> a great adventure. Um, and the, my biggest challenge was learning to drive and I'm a really appalling driver at the best of times and I was even worse on the other side of the road um, but luckily I only drive at about 10 miles an hour so I didn't have too many accidents and an insurance policy um, and I have still no, absolutely no idea about what American football involves I still cannot understand the rules um, despite watching it every week um, in July I decided to part ways with Simon um, and it was really it was really to just empower myself. I, I spent a lot of time with Julie, and Julie is self-coached. She has had coaches, but now she's self-coached. And I think she may, I mean, training with her made me realize that I could, do, I could do the same. And in fact, I'd find it empowering and liberating to, to be in control of my own program. And I've, that's really the... the the long and, and the short of it. So again, like with Brett, it wasn't um, it wasn't acrimonious, and, and Simon and I still still speak, and I see, still see him quite a lot in Boulder. But it was basically a case of me just wanting to empower myself and, and to um, to know that everything that I've achieved is is kind of down to me. But having said that, I am definitely not without a support network and I think every athlete needs that so although I set my own program I do run it past um, someone whose advice I trust Dave Scott um, and Jane Scott um, uh, do, uh, uh, are my <coughs> coaches pretty much Dave does my strength and conditioning so I am seeking advice from quite a few uh, uh, select people so I mean I'm not you know out there alone um, Without, without any support. Um, so, to go through um, the races this year, first one was Ironman Australia. I think, I mean, it, it's, it's foolish uh, as any athlete, um, particularly an Ironman athlete, to expect a perfect race. And I've never had a perfect race. And I don't think I ever will have a perfect race. Um, but this is probably one of my best races. Ironman Australia was, was tough. It was my first race without Brett having, and not having Brett in my corner was a big challenge for me mentally and one that I was really happy that I was able to to cope with and, and, and to overcome. Um, it was also um, successful for me because I managed to improve across the board uh, on my times from, from the previous year under similar conditions. Um, so my times were faster and swim swim, bike and run, and it was also great because it was the first race that I'd encountered a flasher, and it should happen more often, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, no, it's all flashy on the bike, and that was, that was fantastic. Um, thank you, whoever it was. Um, um, the next race was Colombia, which probably wasn't my finest moment um, in terms of uh, my triathlon career, but you know, I learned some incredibly valuable lessons. I went there, it's a, Columbia was an, a, an Olympic distance race, and I went there, I wanted to test my short course speed, I wanted to visit um, New England, I hadn't been there for a long time, 
and I wanted also to support the Blaise Mann Foundation, which is a charity that I'm an ambassador for, and it's one of the nominated race charities. So well, I went there wanting to win. I, I, I do every race wanting to win, not expecting to win, but really wanting to win. Um, but I just never got going, and I'm sure a lot of you have, have had this. I just, I just felt completely flat. I was incredibly cold. The water was about 67, and it was non-wetsuit. Oh, 68, because it was on the border. It was non-wetsuit swim for us. I just, I just froze. Um, I don't have too much body fat to keep me warm, but yeah, no, I, I froze, and the feet got away, and I was drowning at the back, and it was all over, over, over. So. Um, I came sixth, and I crossed the line, and I was smiling, but inside I was, I was really disappointed. But I think the lessons that I learned from that race were, were, were more valuable than the lessons I've, I've, I've learned from, from my victories. And, and that sounds very cliché and trite, but it's, it's actually very true. And it made, like, looking back at, at what happened, and there were various reasons why I don't think I performed to my potential. Um, and I could learn from them, but I think the biggest challenge for me was dealing mentally with with not winning. And I think learning to deal with that and learning to be a bit more objective about what success and failure really do mean um, was incredibly important. And I think it did it did make me stronger, and it set me up for a um, for a great race in Kansas and an even better race in in Roth. Um, Kansas 70.3 was fantastic, um, no flashes, um, but a big blow-up doll that was dressed up as Dorothy out of The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> but more like a transvestite, actually, <laughs> um, like a fetish Wizard of Oz, um, with his big pointy <laughs> boobs. But that was, that was great. Um, but no, Kansas is a phenomenal race, great community spirit, the finish line is all decked out like The Wizard of Oz, and I really, really enjoyed that race. Um, it's also memorable, um, perhaps more memorable for me, because I met this guy, um, you can't really get a really good perception of what it's like, but this guy's called Matt, <laughs> this guy's called Red Dog, and he, he runs Dog Days, and it's this awesome concept, basically for the last 20 years, three times a day, seven days a week, he runs community workouts, and up to a thousand people turn up, and kind of wave their legs in the air and, and do all kinds of um, physical activities. He stands there with a big uh, megaphone barking instructions. But in all seriousness, it's absolutely phenomenal. And it was so inspiring. And you saw like little three-year-old kids up to, you know, 80-year-old grandmas and grandpas and anywhere in between, all shapes, all sizes, all ages, all abilities, would just turn out. And I just thought, wouldn't it be absolutely phenomenal if we could scale this up and get you know, a community workout happening all over the world, uh, you know, simultaneously on one day. Um, but, you know, I, I was so inspired by that, and so that was, you know, one of my fondest memories of, of Kansas 70.3. Um, um, it's from Roth. Um, so Roth was my second Ironman race of this year. Um, this is um, some of my... Uh, so my friends and my family, Mark, you, oh, Mark's gone, Mark, you can see um, But I put this up just to show how important support is to me, and that's why I also like um, to race closer to home, is so that my friends and family can make the, the trip out and, and, and come and watch me race, and it really does give me incredible energy, and I hope I showed that by, by my performance at Roth. Um, it was important for me to race at Roth for, for many different re reasons. You know, it's, it's a really famous course. Obviously, it's an incredibly fast course. Um, the course is accurate. Uh, you know, I was skeptical before I, I went there. I was like, how do they, they bike, especially bike such fast times? But, you know, my computer was, it was 179k, so near on, you know, near on 180. Um, but it's closed. It's closed roads, and the road surfaces are impeccable. But closed roads for me means that I can, I don't lose too much time. I'm such a technical numpty that I lose a lot of time going around corners. 
um, and it just means that you can be a bit more fearless when it comes to kind of the descents and, and taking them wide, taking the corners wide, and obviously when you're overtaking people, you can you can um, go on the other side of the road as well. Um, so that's why that you know that is such a fast such a fast bike course. Um, I I had a little bit of illness actually going into Roth, so I wasn't. <coughs> entirely confident with how I was going to perform and I really had to to, um, to put that to the back of my back of my mind and that's why I'm so proud of of, of the time I did at, at Roth because there were you know additional hurdles that I felt that I I had to overcome um, it was also great um, to see to race with Katrina Morrison it was her first Ironman distance race and she had a phenomenal phenomenal race um, came, came, came third and um, broke nine hours and it was really great to race with her she's a good friend of mine and and to have two of us on, on the podium was was really fantastic um, I, I never went to the to Roth expecting to break the world record everyone talked to me about it and I'm really no good at maths and I, I, I did do a bit of calculations about what it would take to, to get below the world record, but I never imagined that I'd break it by 14 minutes. But um, to do so, and likewise to break the course record at, at Kona, is important for me, not for records for record's sake, but just to, to show what women are capable of in the sport. And, for me to break the record and then and then for Beck Key also to, to go six minutes under really shows how much women are improving and how deep the female field is and um, I hope that in the future these records are, are broken by, by me and, and, <coughs> and by others. Um, I wasn't particularly happy with my run at, at Roth. It was um, subpar. <laughs> For me, so it's something that I really want to improve on. Um, same, same goes for Kona, and I definitely know that that there's room for improvement, and and that hopefully I could go um, sub 8:30 at, at at Roth, and I think others can, others can too. Um, back to um, the last race before Kona was <laughs> Timberman 70.3. This is an amazing race, and you just have to go there for the post-race food, if nothing else. It's just this smorgasbord, and it's amazing. But the, the race director, Keith, Keith Jordan, puts on a fantastic race and also owns the local ice cream um, parlor. So you've just got the best ice cream in the whole, in the whole world. Um, and it, uh, both years that I've done Timberman, it's been followed by a photo shoot for, for one of my, my sponsors, Tier and, and the same, uh, we had the same thing this year, <laughs> and I got to play Andy Potts at Twister, <laughs> and I beat him. It's fantastic, but and it was great to go on like kind of left hand green and really get a, a good view of all of his assets. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, um, uh, the, the the tier photo shoot was was great, and we even had the tier Olympics, and we lost at, TJ and I lost at the wheelbarrow race practice that a bit more. Um, but after Timberman, I mean Timberman was a, was a good race for me. Um, I felt really strong, particularly on the bike, so it gave me a lot of confidence um, going into going into Kona. So I had six weeks between between that and Kona. And um, I just went back to Boulder and um, put in some really, really solid training. I mean my training pretty much looks the same from February all the way through till October. For me it's you know, consistency is the key. Week in, week out, and um, I don't train it. I don't change it too much. I don't really have too much of a periodization. Um, it, the, just the speed of um, speed of the intervals changes, but not really the, the structure of the training necessarily. Um, I flew to Kona 12 days before. I don't like to go too early because I I kind of like to retain the excitement that going to Kona kind of has for me, you know, and I think if I go there too early, I won't get the feeling that I'm going there for a race. I'll feel like I'm going there for training and then, then the race. So I like to go there close enough to st for it still to be exciting. And also to have a week of, of training, solid training, um, 
before I start my four day taper. Um, so I train, I, I have a seven day training kind of schedule that, that looks much the same as it would have done in Boulder. And then, um, so it's a two hour run on the Sunday morning and then a, a 45 minute run in the, in, in the evening. Then the Monday I do uh, a shortish swim and then a, a four hour ride. And then Tuesday is, is run intervals and a, and a swim. Wednesday I do a swim and a brick. Um, and this this year I was on. Um, I came in from my ride and had my running shoes out. I was running out the door, and um, coming towards me were two officials in you know official looking clothing. And I knew immediately who they were. They were the anti-doping um, officials. So I said, "You come for me, haven't you?" And they said, they said yes. And I said, oh, I'm just about to go for a run. They said, okay, we'll come with you. <laughs> so I've got these stalking anti doping officials that are driving down the street and following me. And then it took me three hours to pee afterwards, which is probably a world record that shows how dehydrated you can get in, in Kona. Um, but in all seriousness, I just uh, use that kind of anecdote to... Um, to applaud the WTC for the steps that they've made on anti-doping recently. Um, I mean, it's something that I've been pushing quite heavily for and strongly for, and it's and it's great to see that they're taking it a lot more seriously, and we've got more consistent and rigorous anti-doping um, uh, out of competition and and in competition. And I think that's really important for the credibility of, of our sport and. Um, and for its credibility in, in the media. Um, Thursday is my rest day, but it's not really a rest day because it's the day then they have the pro brief and, and I have to do my, the signings for my sponsors at the, at the expo and we have the press conference. Um, and then Friday I do 30 minutes or 45 minute bike, 30 minute swim and a 30 minute run and rack my bike and then the next day is race day. Um, People ask me about um, about the the pressure that um, that I feel going into a race like Kona, and and to be honest, yes, there is a huge amount of pressure. But I put the majority of that pressure on myself. I have huge expectations of myself, um, and so I don't think the pressure that that people put on me kind of adds to that. And if anything, I. I kind of use it to my advantage and use it to kind of give me the energy I need um, rather than rather than bring me down. Yes, I do have additional obligations. Other athletes have those too, and I'm not unique in that. And I just have to manage it. You know, it's part and parcel of being world champion, and I, I, um, I'm more than prepared to do that if it means that I can hold the world Ironman crown. It's just a a case of, of needing to be a bit more organised and um, uh, having a having a manager that can take a lot of the weight off, off your shoulders and, and tell me where I need to be and, and when. Um, but I do think the mental preparation is important as, as the physical preparation, regardless of what what race I do. And I have you know different techniques that help me help me relax and help me prepare. Different visualisation techniques. Um, reading books, watching movies, losing to myself at Scrabble on the Nintendo little thing, Game Boy thingy. Um, most importantly though, I think I take confidence in the fact that I've learned how to hurt in training. And for me that's really important. I, I push myself as hard as I can in training and um, push myself to the limit and exceed those limits and so when I'm racing I can reflect back and really have confidence that my body will not let me down and that I've suffered those dark times in training and have, have come through the other side and I think that's incredibly important and it's um, mental strength that comes from the physical strength but it, it can't be underestimated. Um, in terms of my competition, it was so incredibly strong this year. The female field was as deep as it's ever been, and there were so many great athletes 
you know, throughout the year, the, the girls have really raised the bar, uh, like Teresa Marcel on the bike, um, Beck Keat has, you know, improved leaps and bounds under, under Brett, of course, Marinda Caffrey, um, Katrina Morrison, um, there's, you know, there's so many, um, so many women there, and it was, it, it's continuing to grow, and that's, that's really, really, really great for the sport. Um, so the race, let's do one again. Um, I wasn't actually that nervous in the morning of the race. Um, I just, I, I knew that all the hard work had, had been done and I was just chomping at the bit for the race to start. Um, the minutes just seemed to tick by so slowly and I just couldn't wait for the the gun to go off. I remember sculling on the start line and I looked over to my left and there's a mountain and the sun had just risen and it was kind of hazy and I just felt a huge sense of peace and it was really quite a special moment. I wrote about it in my blog but um, I really knew then that it was going to be a really a, a really special special day um, and then the gun went off and the fist fight um, began. Um, I was really happy with my swim this year. I was, um, I've worked really hard on it and it's always good when your hard work um, kind of pays dividends. I think the difference between this year and, and races past was that I actually fought. Um, not only at the start, um, when obviously you have to go really the worst, go as hard as you can for the first two, 200, 400 meters, but I fought throughout the throughout the swim to try and stay on the feet of stay on the fastest feet that I that I could and you know that that worked in my favour and I I I, think I managed to come out of the water ahead of some of you know my strongest competitors. I think that put me in an advantage because they didn't know where I was and I think I could take off on the bike with without them, you know, having the opportunity necessarily to, to to catch me and gauge where you know where I was. Um, what sometimes on the bike it takes me a while to get going, and this this year I felt really strong right from the outset. I've, um, like I said, had the opportunity to train with some really strong cyclists, and I was I was more confident in, in my in my riding this year, and I was determined that it was kind of the ace card that I was I was going to play and. I didn't want. I don't ride conservatively. I don't race conservatively. I just wanted to smash myself right from the word go. So I did, and I went into the lead about about 20 miles and and didn't really didn't really look back and just concentrated, stayed in the moment, concentrated on my form and just tried to focus on overtaking as many boys as I <laughs> as I could. <laughs> um, it was it was pretty windy actually coming home. The last forty miles or so were were incredibly tough, but it it suits me because I push I push quite a big gear, so I just, I just ground my ground my way uh, into it. Um, onto the run, I didn't actually feel that great at the start of the run. I um, I had a I had a stitch and my hamstring was was hurting. And it was only after um, three miles when I saw these guys. <laughs> it wasn't a figment of my imagination. It actually exists. This is um, John Blaze, um, the late John Blaze. This is his dad, um, posing with bananas. But they were at the three mile mark holding a big placard saying, will you marry me? Um, and this made me smile. But in all seriousness, you know, it, it did give me a lot of energy, actually. And I found my found my legs and um, went through the half mile, uh, sorry, the half marathon point in about 125, which was which was good for me. And then it all fell apart. Um, and I, uh, it was incredibly hot in Kona this year. And I, I, I think I, I suffered suffered in the heat. I don't think I, I could get enough. I didn't get enough. Uh, fluids on board and I um, my, my time slowed and I, I finished in, in, in 303 which is actually quite 
quite disappointing for me. Um, but people ask me, you know, when did you know you'd, you'd win the race? And it was probably only in the last five miles. And those five miles were when it really, really hurt. And although I was smiling, it was it was actually a real a real struggle. Um, but I think I was lucky that I had that that cushion between myself and 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 the girl in, in second place with um, Rini and, and Virginia. Um, because otherwise, <coughs> you know, if, they, if they'd have been a lot closer, I think it would have been a real, a real, real battle to maintain the lead. But in those last five miles, I had the confidence that, that my body would, would carry, me, carry me through. And it was only in the last couple of miles that I flicked my watch over to kind of cumulative time. And then people started yelling to me that, you know, you can, you can break the record, you can break the record. Um, so I did. I did push it in, in the last in the last mile, and but of course I I slowed down um, a little bit and coming onto a leaky drive, um, which is which is the final stretch, um, just to soak up the atmosphere and really give give my appreciation um, to the crowds. You know, I always think it's amazing. I'm, I'm finishing the run and people are just going out on the run and they spend a lot of their energy and breath cheering me on and, and giving me high fives and congratulating me and I always think that's amazing. That's partly why I go back to the finish line at, you know, after after my race is finished, just to give something give something back to them. But you know, crossing the finish line at, at Kona, it's so it's so difficult to put it into words. Um, and I think I guess this picture says more than I, I ever could. Um, Relief and satisfaction that all your hard work has paid off. Joy, elation, um, and a huge amount of pride um, in having the opportunity to, to hold the Union Jack and to be able to roll across the line um, for John Blaze. Um, and to have my mum and dad at the finish line really means so much to me because although I race alone, um, I certainly um, couldn't do it without the support of of, um, of them and, and, and a lot of other key key people and, and every, you know I'm not unique in that and everyone's the same but just to be able to share my victory with them is is incredibly important to me and, and my victory is is theirs and I, I uh, it meant so much to me to have to have them there. Um, of course, breaking the record was um, was a was a big achievement and incredibly humbling. Actually, Paula is a legend and an, and an icon, and I've I've got a long way to go before I reach her heights, you know. But as I've said previously, it's it's a, it's significant not for me but for the sport, um, just to show that that women are improving and that, that more is possible and that we can continue to raise the bar um, and give men a run for their money as well. Um, yeah, but I hope my record will be broken by me again and, and by others because I really truly believe that we can get stronger and we can get faster and I hope that it is broken because that's what records um, are there for. Um, Nutrition. <laughs> um, so I just thought I'd quickly go through what what I eat um, on a on a daily basis. I eat a sizable, healthy, balanced diet. I don't calorie count, but I guess if I was to put a figure on it, it'd be about four or five thousand calories a day. Um, I eat two breakfasts: one before my first session, and, and a bigger one afterwards lunch, dinner and snacks in between. Um, it's what you imagine it might look like, a large amount of um, non-refined carbs. I don't eat a lot of white rice or white pasta or white bread, but a lot of brown bread, brown pasta, brown rice, bulgur wheat, that, that, those kind of more complex grains. Loads of fruit and vegetables, um, red meat once a week, um, and chicken and fish um, every, almost, every, well, yeah, every day. 
Um, I don't tend to eat anything in sessions that are less than an hour, but then after kind of 60 to 90 minutes, I'll have um, an energy gel or, or bars. Um, so um, I carry this, I mean, this is a diet I, I have for much of the year, but then three days before a race, I really limit the amount of caffeine, I'm sorry, limit the amount of fiber I take on. Um, I, I stick to ref, more refined carbs and cut out uh, most fresh fruit and, and vegetables. And also seven days before the race I cut out caffeine. I norm, ordinarily have two cups, like one or two cups of coffee a day. But I cut caffeine out so that you really get a kick on race day when you've got uh, <coughs> caffeinated gels. And I do take um, Pro Plus tablets as well on the bike. Um, and I think you get an extra kick out of those if you've gone cold turkey for the week, um, the week before. And this is my race day nutrition. Um, breakfast is is like oh, I shouldn't say cup of tea. I should have uh, deleted that. Um, so cream of rice is kind of like this slop, like baby food. It's kind of very fine granulated white white rice. I mix that like you would with porridge, but with you mix it with water, and then I mix in tahini, which is sesame seed paste with, for fat and protein, and then honey for additional carbohydrate. Half a cup of coffee with milk, and then a small banana. Then I don't eat anything um, before the swim, just swim, just sip water, um, but not too much water. And um, I don't drink anything until after, sorry, I don't take on any, um, any calories until after about a mile on the bike. I get onto the bike, settle into my rhythm, into my position, and then I start to um, have sips of um, energy drink. So I have two bottles of Cider Max, one on the down tube and one that I replace. Um, so when that's finished, I replace it with the one on the back. About 450 calories that I've spelled wrong in each. I need to spell check. Um, two gels, one at 90K, one at the turnaround point, and then one about half an hour from the end. That last one's caffeinated. And then one chocolate bar that I kind of have a bite of um, uh, in, in, uh, at different stages throughout the ride. And then water. I, um, as, as many of you know, I don't wear an aero helmet. Um, two reasons. Um, my head's not in the correct position long enough to get any benefit from it whatsoever. And two, because my, as you can tell, I get really hot um, very easily, and um, I need to be able to to lose the heat that my head emits through the air helmet and be able to pour water on my head as well to cool me down. Um, on the run, I have one gel in in T2 and then one gel every 25 minutes, and then until two hours when I really couldn't face taking anything on board and I think that's really why I did suffer at the back end of the marathon and again water over my head and <coughs> over my body and sometimes in my mouth. Um, the, the, the rough formula I try and follow is, is one gram of carbs per kilo of body weight per hour so I weigh around 60 kg so 60 grams of carbs per hour that's the rough formula that seems to work for not only me but for, for quite a few other people um, of course, it's really indiv uh, it's individual, and it's still trial. I mean, it's it's trial and er error, and I'm still learning. You know, I still suffer GI problems, um, particularly on the run, and and it often has no rhyme or rhyme or reason. It's very difficult to replicate, you know, race intensity and length in, in practice. But it's an, you know something that I'm working on. I would encourage all of you. Um, to look at the electrolyte balance, particularly those that are doing longer course racing, look at the electrolyte balance of your, your drink um, and ascertain whether you need to take on additional salts because some people take on too much salt um, and that can actually cause cramping and can cause um, fluid loss from your cell, the cells of your body. So you're actually doing more harm than good. So really be aware of the electrolytes that you, you've got in your drink. And if they're sufficient, then, then don't, you don't need to take salt tablets. I don't actually take um, any, um, any additional salt in the form of tablets. Um, Post-race, I eat anything that's put in front of me. Although I have to say the pizza at the end of 
and why it's suboptimal. And people pay $500 to enter and they get this cold moldy pizza. So I'm going to start lobbying for, for burgers and kebabs and fish and chips and stuff. Um, so fate of me, um, this was just before the press conference and Henry Budget from Try 24-7 got that uh, got that picture that was then broadcast all over the web. <laughs> <laughs> Might get a chip sponsor next year. <laughs> um, um, since Kona, as you might imagine, it's been a huge whirlwind. I spent um, two, two and a half weeks in the US doing a, as much media as I, as I possibly could. Um, and I also got to see The Lion King on Broadway. <laughs> which was probably the highlight of, of 2009, it's phenomenal. And I got to see you too in Phoenix, which was, which was great as well. But aside from that, I was running, rushing around like a blue ass fly, um, here, there and everywhere, just, just trying to uh, maximize the opportunity to really put GB on the map in the US when it comes to triathlon. Um, I, got back, um, I got back a week ago, and um, again, doing a lot of um, a lot of media work and trying to get some snatched moments with my family and friends. Um, I haven't been doing that much training over the past month. I think that's really important for me to get a mental and a and a physical break. Um, I'm going to go to Nepal tomorrow. Um, my relaxing holiday, trekking to Everest. Um, for, for 18 days and, and as I said I think we all need that regardless of whether we're pro or amateur I think it's so important to take time off for the off season just to do exactly what it is you enjoy um, and that doesn't necessarily involve swim, bike and run and I, I know um, based on my experience that I'll come back stronger and more hungry than ever after I've taken after I've taken that little that little break um, like I said, I've, I've, I have been trying to do as much media as, as I can, not, not for me necessarily, but just because I think it's so important to get triathlon out of its kind of niche market and into the, into the mainstream. And that's why winning the Sunday Times Award was really so important to me. Um, I mean, it was, it was an incredible honor um, and I was up against some, some fantastic girls that have achieved great things and I really didn't expect to win um, and a few tears were shed when they, when, they, when they announced my name but in all seriousness it's great for the sport you know for a newspaper like the Sunday Times to recognize Ironman and, and triathlon more generally it's fantastic and I really have seen a significant improvement from 2007 to to now, um, in terms of, of the coverage that that triathlon is getting, and that's not just down to me. It's down to Alistair and Jody and and Julie that are achieving things across the board in um, in triathlon. Um, so uh, I'll go to Nepal, and then I'm going to spend December in the UK, and it's really important to me to to spend some time, like I said, with with my family and friends, um, I, I, it's hard for me being away from, from the UK for, for much of the year. So I've decided that I want to want to spend December here and, and Christmas with my family. And I also want to try and catch a glimpse of Linford Christie at Sports Personality of the Year and his lunchbox. <laughs> It'll be very pleasing to be on. And Matt Dawson too, he's quite nice. Um, but no, so I, um, I'm lucky enough I got an invite to sports personality, so it'll be great to go. I don't anticipate that they're going to give triathlon a high profile. I hope they do, but it would be you know, a fantastic opportunity for me. I'll be like a kid in a candy store going there and seeing all my, my sporting heroes. Um, in terms of races next year, I've, I've not made a, a, a final decision. It will look much the same as this year. I'll do a, an Ironman race in the spring, one in the summer, and then of course um, Kona. Uh, in the spring, um, there, there are quite a number of different races on offer. Um, I'm quite attracted to the Abu Dhabi race, um, partly because I think it's important for me to support not only Ironman races, but also non-Ironman races, and, and encourage different 
um, or would support different race directors and, and race organisers. Um, and that's why I was really excited to race at Roth last year and um, just encouraging different race formats um, I think is quite important. So it's a 3k swim, a 200 kilometre bike and then a, a 20 kilometre run in, in Abu Dhabi which is bound to be really cold. Um, <laughs> But no, that's, that's one possibility, but there, there are others. And then my own man in the summer will either be Roth or Ironman Germany in Frankfurt, and then, and then of course Kona, um, and some 70.3s, three or four 70.3s um, in between times. Um, I just thought I'd mention 2012, because a lot's been made um, this, this week of, of statements that I may or may have not said um, regarding the Olympics. Um, you know, the first question I'm always asked by British journalists is, are you going to go for the Olympics? And um, it's a very difficult one to answer because I don't want to close any doors. Yet I think that, you know, that the opportunities I've got to, to do gymnastics in the Olympics are somewhat <laughs> limited. <laughs> given my lack of flexibility, <laughs> which Mark will concur with. Um, but um, for me, Hawaii is my Olympics. It, you know, Kona is, is, is the Olympics. It's the pinnacle of my sport, and I feel like I've achieved my Olympic gold medal having, having won there. Um, so, you know, if I retired tomorrow, I would retire happy having never, never been to the Olympics. But there's another part of me that loves a challenge. And lawn bowls is it? No, it's not lawn bowls. Um, I don't think that I've got the skill set that's necessary for for short course triathlon. Um, I don't think I've got the leg speed that's needed to be incredibly competitive there, and I wouldn't want to race and, and, and come come thirtieth. And I also love the non-drafting format. I like to know that everything I've achieved is down to me and me alone. Um, and I think that the the, the, um, the short course athletes, while in, whilst incredibly talented, have a different skill set and different qualities to, and talents to, to, to those that, that longer course athletes have. I wouldn't totally close the door, but I think it's highly unlikely. Um, I would like to try some time trials next year, um, shorter time trials, 10 mile, 25 mile, just to see how competitive I could or couldn't be. Um, you know, I, if I'd have tried, tri never have tried triathlon, I never would have known how good I could be. If I'd never have taken the risk and, and, and gone full time, gone professional, then I never would have, have become world Ironman champion. So I think I'd be foolish to totally close the door to, to an opportunity um, such as racing the time trial at the Olympics. But I'm under no illusions about how difficult it is to cross disciplines. It's a, it's a totally different event and I may not be suited to it, but I would like to at least put a tiptoe through that door and, and to see whether it, there's at least a possibility. Um, so no, I'm not giving up Iron Man. Iron Man is my focus. Um, but I would like to do some tri time trials next year just to, just to see how, how good or otherwise I could be. Um, this is me in the pool with Everest. Um, you know, I, I look back at, at how my life has changed over the last three years and it's really, um, it's quite difficult to, to believe that I'm sitting here as three-time world champion. I couldn't even believe when I won it once, let alone winning it three times and I come back here and, and it's it's coming home for me. I train in, in uh, I lived and trained in Putney at, you know, Richmond Park is my stomping ground and Box Hills where I have my Bovril. Um, and it's fantastic to be back and I realise that, that so much has changed but yet so so little little has changed. Um, I never expected to be to be world champion once, let alone three times. But for me, it's an amazing opportunity, not just to achieve my potential uh, on the pitch and, and see what I'm capable of at swim, bike and run, but to, to use my position as a professional athlete to really make 
some positive changes and that's something that I've talked about a lot and I'm sure some of you are really bored of hearing it but I don't think I can ever say it too much and I'm really proud to be your world champion I'm really proud to be a British world champion and I'll do everything that I can to um, to raise the profile of the sport in the media um, uh, and particularly in the mainstream media um, but also I have an amazing opportunity to combine two of my passions, sport and development. And it's something that I'm incredibly passionate about. It's something that drives me each and every day. Um, and I will devote um, as much energy as I can to the causes that I care about as I do to swim, bike and run. Unfortunately, I don't have as much time as I want and I'm constantly frustrated that I can't do more but I will do as much as I can with the limited time that I've got at the moment to raise awareness of, oh shit, of the causes by, um, is that right? Oh, yes. Um, and some of them are up there on the screen and I really want to thank you all for donating Fiverr to come and listen to me ramble. It will all go to, to Macmillan which is, is a, a charity that's really close close to my heart. Um, one organisation that I have helped to set up is, is called Go Tribal. It's a women's empowerment organisation and you can find out more about that on my website. It's, it's aimed at getting more women and girls involved in sport by breaking down some of the barriers <coughs> that I um, believe exist in, um, in entering sport and, and, and particularly endurance, endurance sports. Um, but, you know, I believe the more that I can achieve in the sport, the more I can achieve out of it. And when I, you know, when I train and when I race, this is, this is what's at the fore of my mind. And, and when I retire and when I move on, I, I want that to be the legacy that I leave, not necessarily records and, and times and number of races won. Um, so just to finish off, I just want to thank you all once again. Um, this is me rolling for, for John Blaze across the finish line. Um, thank you so much for taking time out to, to come. Um, of course, to Mark and everyone else at Physio for Life for providing the coffee and the cakes. Um, and do feel free to ask me anything you want. Honestly, I'll answer <laughs> as truthfully as I possibly can. Um, and then I'll sign anything you want me to sign, including what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Chrissy, you mentioned that there's a really strong uh, women's field and lots of people coming through, but so far in Ironman distance they've all been behind you. And I think the closest they've got is something like eight minutes or something. What do you think that they can do to get closer to you? Believe that they can beat me. Um, I, you've got to have self-belief and, um, you know, I've shown this year, I mean, I haven't, I haven't been unbeaten in every, um, every race I've done and I think they've just got to believe in, you know, believe in, in their abilities and I think that that's, that mental challenge is, is more important than, than the physical, the physical one. But, you know, I hope that that I'm raising the bar. I'm not the only one that's raising the bar. You know, there are, there are athletes that I'm looking looking at. You know, I knew Teresa myself, for example, is a fantastic biker, so I knew I'd have to bite my heart out, you know, if, if I was to come off the bike ahead of her. So there are people that, you know, that are also driving me forward. So hopefully people will look to me and think, you know what, I can do what, what she's doing and I've got to get here and this is what I need to do to get to get here, but hopefully, you know, that with self-belief and um, and something to aim for, they will be on my heels. I think you're pretty motivated to say it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I just want to, I just want to get faster and stronger, and I don't think that I've reached my potential yet. I think I can continue to improve, especially on the back end of the marathon. Um, 
so that that's what drives me forward. Um, and you know, I I won't I won't rest until I I think I've you know achieved what what I'm capable of. Um, but they're certainly giving me something to aim for as well, and, and having them behind me is <coughs> is definitely a motivation for me as much as I am for them. What sort of hours do you put into training, Chrissy? I don't log them. Um, I don't log my hours or, or my Ks or miles. Um, I, I do focus very much on quality rather than rather than quantity. Almost all of my sessions have an element of, of intensity in them, whether it's or, or strength work or, um, or something like that. Uh, four to six hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I I don't I take a rest day as and when I need it. I haven't taken many rest days this year, but I guess what you gotta remember is that, that we have the luxury that m most of the age groupers don't and that we can, <coughs> we can rest in between sessions. You know, we're not trying to cram them in at lunch hours or after work. Um, we can, you know, I do my first session, I can put my feet up for three hours before I do my next one. So my rest is incorporated in, into each and every day and that's an integral part of, of my training is, is my resting. Um, so in terms of, of hours of swim, bike and run, about four to six, but really it's 24 seven, you know, it's about when I'm resting, it's about when I'm sleeping, it's about when I'm eating, you know, all of that is training, training my body. But yeah, I don't do a lot of, um, a lot of volume, um, or a lot of junk, junk miles. Like my longest ride is, I did one six hour ride this year. Um, the rest are between four and a half and five hours for my long ride. And my long run, my longest run was two and a half. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not excessive volume, definitely. I like to try and get bang for buck in my sessions if I can. wondering because are you sort of racing into a lot of data if you like on race day you checking your heart rate and speed and stuff or are you just racing by feel on, on the day um both when i train and when i race i race I, I train and race on feel i've never used heart rate monitor i've never used a power a power meter um you know so i'm probably not the best person to ask about the advantages of both of those pieces of technology. Um, I can tell you why I don't use them, um, if you want. Um, I, I see the value in, in power, and I've, a lot of, a lot of um, other athletes use it and, and see the benefits. So it's, it's something that I, I, I might consider using in, in the future for certain sessions. But heart rate, I don't think is a particularly good indicator of um, performance <coughs> or output. Um, I think too many things affect heart rate and um, it's not the best barometer. Um, I also think that you, you as an athlete, me as an athlete, excuse me, I need to develop this, this sense, this feel, this intuition about what my body is doing, how it's feeling. Um, and when I get on the bike, for example, I know what race pace feels like. I don't need a, anything on the front to tell me um, I'm going too fast or going too slow because I sense it. You know, I know what pace I can sustain for, for X amount of, of time. Um, I also don't want to come home and obsess over numbers. You know, I, I think you lose the rawness and spontaneity and the joy associated with training if you've got this overemphasis on numbers. You know, when I come home, I've done the training, <coughs> it's over. You know, I've given it as much as I could, and regardless of what the numbers say, that's all I can ask of myself. You know, I, I remember something that Brett, my old coach, Brett Sutton, said to me, and he, I'd had a shocker of a, a swim session, it was really shit, and Sorry, Liz. Um, and um, he said to me, some, some sessions are stones and some are stars, but they're all rocks and we build with them. And what he meant was that 
You might not be hitting the times that you set yourself, or that have been set for you, but as long as you've given it everything, then you've got the same amount out of the session. You've got the same benefit out of the session, even if you haven't hit your target, as long as your, um, your perceived input has, has been to, the, uh, to your maximum, as it were. Do you see what I mean? So, I try and remember that if I've had a, a, a bad session because I do have bad, you know, do have bad sessions, um, and it's important for me just to bank it and and move on and, and realise that even though it's been a bad session in terms of hitting my times, I've still reaped the benefits from it physically and probably even more so mentally. Would you ever think about upping the distance and seeing what you could do with a sort of double iron? Distance or even further, um, <clears throat> Double Ironman doesn't necessarily appeal to me. It's too much chafing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That'd just be a world of pain, wouldn't it? I think I'm a Vaseline up to you. Um, no, that doesn't, that doesn't appeal to me, but adventure racing does. I've done, I've done a couple of adventure races, and that's definitely something that I want to do um, once I kind of hang up my, my Ironman lycra. Um, just that kind of, like I said before, the rawness of, of adventure racing and you being at one with, with nature really appeals to me and that's definitely something that I want to do in the future. And there are plans for different endurance type events, you know, cycling the length of Britain and, and cross continents and things like that, but I won't be doing it in the next couple of years, but it's definitely, excuse me, definitely in the pipeline. <coughs> 